So I'm Tony Gandana, I'm one of the instructors in the FSI program, and it's my pleasure to introduce I.J. Lama Murthy and and Aishu Lama Murthy and Ahasya Kumar, and we're going to talk with about uh, some anti-cancer agents. So go ahead. Hi, my name is Ahasya Kumar. And I'm Aishu Lama Murthy. And we're going to talk to you today about anti-cancer agents, specifically amino acid agents and this is the present ball. So we've been working on drug development in the organic chemistry lab with Dr. Michael Mosher and two undergrad assistants, Alyssa Clausen and Andrew Lenny. So as we know, cancer is a growing concern in the U.S. and the world, and with more and more diagnosed, uh, more and more cases being diagnosed each year. So what our anti-cancer approach is going to be for this study is to create intercalating drugs. Now, intercalation means to insert between. So with an intercalating drug, you want to be able to create a drug that is able insert itself between the DNA and the Now, we have, uh, the primary objective of our uh, study is sort of a three-step process. We want to create an acidine drug that is, one, able to bind DNA strongly, two, uh, able to interact with the enzyme DNA to avoid dominant two, which we'll get to later, and three, inhibit the re-ligation of DNA. Now, I should be using a means of the third type of proper reaction, and I will be able to carry these my study, and we'll get into both of those things. So our study is based off of a drug that was created in the 70s known as meta amphetamine And meta amphetamine is an intercalating drug that's used to fight childhood leukemia. And so to really understand how that drug works, you have to understand what properties a molecule has to possess to be able to intercalate. So for one, it has to be a planar structure. So it has to be flat enough that it's able to insert itself into the DNA duplex. Um, second, it has to be a conjugated ring structure, meaning that it alternates bonds. So it goes from single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond. And that um, allows for an interaction known as high high stacking, which I'll get into in a minute. And the third thing is that it has to possess cationic character. So it, um, it has to be positively charged because the DNA phosphate backbone is negatively charged. So this allows our molecules to be attracted to the DNA. And so the um, problem with meta is that it suffers from rapid metabolic decomposition. So it exhibits a half life of 23 minutes. And so um, in that time, it's not able to bind effectively enough with the DNA. So when it decomposes in the body, it breaks down into biologically inactive compounds that are ineffective against cancer, and even worse, they raise hepatic toxicity, so they cause liver poisoning. Um, so uh, specifically for pi pi stacking, what that is is um, um, electrons orbit in different um, shapes, and there's an S orbital which is kind of spherical around the nucleus, and there's a P orbital that's above and below the nucleus. So when there's a sigma bond, or a single bond, it's known as a sigma bond, and the, uh, there's interactions between the electrons and S orbital, and that's tighter between the nuclei. But when interactions take place between the P orbitals above and below the nucleus, that's known as a pi bond. And um, when pi bonds interact, when the pi bonds, pi bonds in the DNA interact with pi bonds in the molecule that we put into there, it's known as an interaction called pi pi stacking, and that creates stability within the molecule. So, um, in order to create this drug, we need to understand what goes on inside the cell, specifically with the DNA. Now, we know that the nucleus is a very, very small space, and the DNA is even a yeah, small space inside that. And not all the DNA is being used to have a process at the same time, so all the unused DNA needs to be compacted and superposed through storage. So that's sort of this enzyme, the DNA support normally two comes in. And essentially, uh, there's a three-step process on the DNA. So if you picture the enzyme as a drug super here and the DNA as a ribbon, you can see that the first step that the enzyme does is ligate the DNA or cut it, and then pass the loop through that uh, cut, and then deligate it here or uh, stitches it back up. And what uh, the enzyme does this process repeatedly throughout the strand until the entire strand is compacted into the void for storage. Now, as you know, in the body, cancerous cells grow at a much faster rate than somatic cells or normal cells. And um, essentially, because that occurs, this enzyme occurs at a faster rate and essentially on overdrive because it has to uh, uh, work much faster to sort of keep up with the fast growth of the cancerous cell. So we, what we want our drug to do is to be able to interact with this enzyme so that it is able to uh, bind to it and then sort of make it mess up in its process and into the ligation cycle of the, of the DNA. So if it's able to do that, the DNA will actually be cut easily, meaning that it will be rendered useless and the cell will eventually die. 
Now, hopefully, it's on my student defining type board. We don't know it yet, but further research will hopefully give us that answer. So, meta amphetamine as a drug, when it was binded with the DNA, it was observed that it did interact with the DNA metabolite on my too, and the fact that that led into the ligation, as Ashley mentioned, but we aren't sure why that is. We aren't sure what interaction took place, and that's why we're testing so many different stocks. So our base reactant for all of our reactions is an active molecule known as nitroacridine, and it's, the reason that we use that is because it's able to interpolate with DNA. And so when we uh, when we decide on what to have it use, we have to take a few things into consideration. For one, as I mentioned earlier, it must be a cation. So all of our tethers have nitrogen in them because nitrogen is positive and physiological pH. Um, also, we want to maximize the, um, high, the we want to maximize hydrogen yield. So our product has the most potential for hydrogen bonding. And we also want um, molecules with the highest with high electron withdrawing character. So I'm specifically using aminos that resemble large sugar structures so that they can optimize um, hydrogen yield. And I'll be using purity as my tether. And the reason we use that is because they haven't really been used before and they fulfill all the interpolation requirements so that they would be a good potential for the tether to the growth. So for every reaction we do, there's this general procedure that is followed. The first thing that we do is take our two reactions, uh, nitroacridine, which is our base reason for each, each reaction, and we react it with our tether. And we do that by calculating mass amounts of both, and then getting it, and then adding a solvent to the molecule, which helps speed up the reaction process. So once we have that amount, we put it on the surface for a couple of hours to allow it to become a little volatile mixture. So in a couple of hours that we heat it up, um, usually at the end of the uh, solid, so we have to. Uh, go through extraction, extracting the product, and so usually we put in a, whatever solvent is dissolved in or form methyl acetate water, and that increases the volume so we can work with it. And then we go through our first purification step, known as washing. And for most of our reactions, the main byproduct is hydrochloric acid. So to get rid of that, we want to neutralize it. So we usually add a strong base like sodium hydroxide or sodium bicarbonate. And when they react, we turn into water. And then because of the different densities, they'll separate and we can wash out whatever we don't want. And we run through that process a few times just with different chemicals. And um, finally, at the end, we dry our solution with um, a substance of anhydrous sodium sulfate, which takes the water out of it. So after that, we take our solution and we grab the filter into a paired flask. So a flask that's already been um, measured or weighed. And then we evaporate the solvent from it. And how we do that is we put it in a machine that we can see there um, called a rotovac. And the rotovac decreases the pressure inside of the flask, which decreases the boiling point. And we're heating up the substance here, and so that causes the solvent to evaporate. So the next thing we do is the process known as chromatography. And essentially, what this is, it's a method by which you can purify the compound and rid it of any unnecessary uh, components that come on. So there are three methods. There are three methods of chromatography that we did in the lab. There are more methods, but what was available to us were these three methods. So the first kind is column chromatography, and in that you get a wet column in which um, you add a base and a uh, you say this is a sand and a silicon gel and fill it up about halfway, and then you're able to flush the solvent and your product through. And what the silicon gel does essentially is because because it is polar, it's able to stick more uh, stick more strongly to certain components of your product causing it to flow uh, more slowly throughout the column. So uh, your regular product um, that is uh, getting purified along the column will be collected in a flask at the bottom. And another uh, type of chromatography we're doing is called radio chromatography, which uses a device uh, uh, known as a chromatic rod. You can see here. And um, uh, what this does is it, it, you put a circular silica plate inside this device and it's able to rotate very rapidly. So then you can drip your um, your solvent and your product at a certain rate and it's because it's tends to be more than other assets. It will expand outward outside the plate and it will get collected in fractions at the bottom while it's being purified. So the next thing we do is uh, the third type of chromatography, uh that's PLC or thin layer chromatography. And this type of chromatography doesn't allow us to collect the compound. But because we're getting it in such small amounts, we only put the broth on the plate. And essentially, what this does is to help us test how well our compound has been purified. So we can determine like compounds by seeing how many separations that occur on the plate. So 
same substances will separate to the same point and we can throw out any impurities and we can separate each um, different thing that we produce into separate bands. And our ultimate goal is to see what we did produce. So we run our, each of those bands through a machine known as an NMR spectroscopy machine, which kind of shows us the hydrogen proton concentration of everything that we produce so we can see what compounds were actually made. And then we can determine if they are able, if they have the potential to be divided effectively with DNA, in which case we'll test them on DNA. So we did a total of five reactions uh, for this study. The first one we reacted nine chloride to be in the animal. It was more of a practice reaction for us, so that would be uh, more custom to a lab procedure. And because it was a known reaction, we already had these results. In the second reaction we ran was with a compound known as cyclohexylamine. And the reason that we used that was previously we used a compound known as cyclohexylamine that worked really well. The only difference is this is a five membered ring and not a six membered ring. But um, two of DNA base pairs have five membered rings in them, so we thought that this would produce even more interaction. A third one that we ran was with transform you know, which is just a very large molecule resembling a sugar more so than the other. And the fourth and third reactions we did uh, were the terpene, three amino you know, acids of terpene, and five amino you know, acids methyl terpene. And essentially, because these are terpenes and propylene, so we didn't really know what to expect, but that's why we did these reactions. So, to actually test our um, DNA, uh, our drug and DNA, we used a buffer solution, so with a pH of 7. And then we um, put it in a UV visible spectrometer and we heated up our DNA solution. And as the DNA was heated up, it started to begin to denature and we emitted UV rays and tested the absorbent. And so as the DNA base pairs began to unstack, absorbent increased. And there's a point at which 50% of the DNA is denatured and that's known as the melting temperature. So the idea was if the drug was attached to the DNA, it would take longer for the DNA, um, DNA to reach that 50 percent marker, that melting temperature. So we were testing for that change in melting temperature between DNA without a drug in it and DNA with our specific drug in it. So uh, if you look here, here's the graph of normal DNA as a species nature, and here's the graph again of normal DNA, but also with the animal drug nature, uh, which you can see the difference in the melting point. So how we uh, calculate the melting point is that we take the graph and uh, we'll internalize it with these uh, plateaus and then we'll like in the middle, and we average the values to find the actual so while that slide is moving, uh, the results section is what we've done next, and here's the typical analysis of what we did. So as I said before, aniline is a known reaction. So uh, we, ex we expected a slightly higher melting temperature, not extremely significant, and a somewhat significant yield. So that was just an expected practice one for us. Cyclopentylamine had a very small increase in melting temperature, not quite what we expected. And um, transforming on cyclohexanol wasn't even tested in DNA because it didn't have enough crust. Uh, 3 million six bone thirteen actually at very high melting temperature, increasing the uh, melting temperature by 12.19 degrees Celsius, which is really good. And it produced a green yield as well. The 5 amino acid methyl thirteen, on the other hand, uh, didn't uh, produce as well a result because it actually had a lower melting temperature. And those produced a significant yield. The fact that it had a lower melting temperature was not very good. So one thing was that for cyclohexylamine, our NMR results were good, so we're rerunning our experiment with using a phenol as a solvent instead of phenol. Um, and uh, the uh, aniline, uh, as I said, is a known reaction, so we had the results expected. And uh, the bromo 30 here, uh, as I said before, because it had a higher uh, melting temperature, further testing will be done where we can actually test how well it react it, it, with how well it interacts. With the enzyme DNA focus on this too, uh, because we already know that the DNA is binding strongly to it. And then the methyl pyridine, uh, as I said before, it produces significant yield of 50%, but uh, because of its low melting temperature, it will not be able to do that much. Okay. So we'd like to thank Ms. Lori Ball for writing the Apple Head program and all of our sponsors for allowing us to be here. Uh, we'd like to thank the Excel Energy Foundation and the Kinder Morgan Foundation for. Uh, funding our research. Um, I'd personally like to thank my parents for uh, funding and allowing me to talk in my favor. And we'd like to thank Tony Gondara for editing our paper and our poster and allowing us to produce the best results we possibly could. And we'd also like to uh, thank Justin Mathabetto for helping me out. Thank you. And we'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Ooh. Are there any questions?
question? How much how much volume how much pollution did you have to do on the last so that's a good question. So for our columns um, from photography, the reason we use that is so we can use larger amounts. So um, yeah, for the column we do uh, is essentially create a so that we can have a larger amount. So like our full solution, whatever we have, but for the radial chromatography and the chromatic one, we can only use about one milliliter. And so that's why we did a second after our um, compound was more purified. And TLC, we only need a uh, single drop of them, but just so that we can see how well the compound is. Yes, Nick? Yes, um, why uh, reducing the high point of the mass which may get the results that we consider reducing, can you go back to the charts and, and uh, some of those kind of legends? I think I'm missing the issue. All the way back to the one more. So um, the x-axis represents the the, uh, the temperature, and the y-axis uh, determines the absorbance. So as you can see, the as the temperature increases from about 30 degrees to around 65 degrees, the absorbance level is sort of at a, uh, the same level. And then after 65 degrees, it suddenly spikes and starts to level up again. So that's the general time we expect in the graph like that. So uh, that's what we use for the normal medium to compare it with the government. Yeah, did you get any um, uh, advice on these also or did you consider these things or did you say um, what was the HPLC? Um, for the HPLC, uh, we, we only did those three types of chromatography. So uh, we didn't really do anything else. So it was mainly those three types of things. Perfect. Um, well, it's kind of interesting in terms of how much the mountain may change. Like you said, like, well, if it's just you know, like, so, you know, how our ultimate goal is to modify our drug so it's acting more effectively. So when it decomposes in the body, like that amplitude, well, if we have a higher melting temperature, that means that the chemical molecules are going to be more stable. And so that means that they're going to be more stable. And so that means that they're going to be more stable. And so that means that they're going to be more stable. And so that means that they're going to be more stable. And so that means that they're going to be more stable. And so that was our ultimate goal to see how tightly it binds into DNA. But when none of our tests showed how it interacted with top of our so that's further said. We just have to make sure it's able to bind effectively with the DNA before we go on further. So essentially, the higher the melting temperature, the better. So we have a question from an online viewer who said that the research is great, but he would like to know uh, what he learned uh, about the you know, specific time of going to the chemistry. What specifically did he learn about the basic process? Well, um, for me, uh, I think that I'm not really knowing much about chemistry at all. And this uh, six, weeks, uh, six weeks of research really opened my eyes to see how amazing it can be in terms of uh, the like concepts such as interpolation and how well um, uh, compounds survive inside the body and how you have to take all of that into account to create a drug that's about the same. I think, yeah, like I think working in a lot I can just apply every concept so much more like we learn. Specifically, chemical wise, what dissolves in what, what you use, um, what chromatography is, how to purify a reaction, like um, how to work all the equipment and all the concepts that go along that. And you're also able to, with every uh, method or procedure you do, you're able to understand, oh, this is why that happens. It's actually not that complicated to do. So, a lot of it uh, is really, it becomes really intuitive to you, essentially. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yeah. So you talked about how high price vacuum had its ability to the molecule as it found in the beginning. Can you tell me like, why that? From as far as I understand, because high bonds aren't necessarily like, they don't touch, they just kind of interact with each other, but they have more movement. If there's just any movement in the molecule, all of the high bonds can kind of transfer over and start interacting with another set of high bonds. And because it's like above and below the nucleus, it can kind of move and interact, it like creating more space. If that makes sense. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you so much for